Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape Oil Painting Demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy. And the painting I'm bringing you today is called Sepia Road. It's a 6x8, and I painted this last week. I quite like it, and um, you didn't ask, but I'm telling you, I like it. Uh, let's see, before we get into a bunch of other stuff, I am painting on a nice piece of hardboard that I had custom cut at my local ply. Um, guy and um, it has been prepped with two coats of transparent gesso um, in this case a transparent gesso of my own manufacturer I will be doing a video soon um, about that and now the color that I am painting with is uh, <laughs> well you've heard of Mike's green and you've heard of Mike's gray now you've heard of Mike's umber <laughs> and what that is comprised of is um, brown ochre and black and uh, you might go, well, geez, it looks like raw umber to me. Why didn't you just use raw umber? And the reason being, um, a lot of times in these drawing uh, stages, I need to lean into some opacity. And raw umber is just so transparent. I really can't get it to behave sometimes. So um, mixing the black with the brown ochre, which has is semi, uh, only semi-transparent or semi-opaque, depending on whether you're a glass half-empty or glass half full guy it gives me a lot more options so that's what we're doing right now and uh, this is based on a photo that I took uh, in my travels and um, basically just came in in the morning and did some work uh, in the studio to composite the photo uh, which I did convert into a sepia toned image um, using some uh, tools in Photoshop uh, um, I like to uh, work uh, pretty extensively with my reference images, um, even to the point they might be a little garish. They might not, they might not be something you'd want to present as a work of art on its own. But it's really part of my process. Um, and uh, I, I didn't do that initially. I was trying to work with regular photographs and then change things on the um, canvas or the board. Um, but I often found that that. Um, it, it was just working against me. I kept pulling in things from the photo. So um, it's really most of my paintings actually start there. Um, unless, of course, they're a study after a master. Or um, in many cases, this sort of painting I would have done from a pictorialist uh, reference. Um, and the reason I worked with my own photo is, uh, in fact, most of the time when I'm doing sepia type stuff, it's some sort of pictorialist reference because I couldn't find what I liked. And um, I knew kind of what I wanted to paint. I wanted to paint these, um, well, really what I find attractive about this scene is these uh, vertical dark trunks um, off to the side of the road and creating kind of a, hmm, what kind of composition would we call this? It's almost an L. I want to call it an L because we have sort of an empty space up in the, uh, in the upper uh, left quadrant of the painting where there's just some subtle clouds painted in there and um, so no I set it up uh, one thing I didn't do I mean I could have uh, I've got the Photoshop skills to have taken my reference and and made it look completely like a pictorialist photo which would have meant eliminating you know 70 80 percent of the detail from that photo um, but that's not really a problem because uh, I, I just got the colors composition and feeling right and uh, and then knew I would just eliminate the detail in my painting since that's uh, something that's always a good idea and maybe we'll make that something we'll talk about a little bit so um, uh, let's assume you're a painter I know a lot of people watch the channel and art painters it's just like watch watching paintings happen and maybe uh, you know listen to me burble on a bit too so um, but let's just assume you are a painter and that uh, you know, you're you're in the struggle. You're in the uh, you're you're fighting the good fight. And painting is not um, well. It's a peaceful activity, but uh, it's not easy to do. Uh, it requires a lot of effort. There's so many ways to go wrong in a picture. Um, starting with, of course, um, bad composition or composition that isn't um, acknowledging. Um, the rules of how uh, people's eyes move through the picture plane and things like that and that's something that's uh, definitely learned over time um, then there's uh, value issues you could have and then 
uh, getting the thing maybe I wanted to discuss today was detail. The over detailing your painting is one of the um, favorite ways that uh, painters starting out uh, like to ruin their paintings. Um, and the, what's really sad is that um, in many cases they might be doing quite a good job of of uh, properly delineating detail from their reference image um, and moving it over onto the painting surface and they're they're getting some you know good effects and um, um, you know you can tell what it is that, that's being painted and this and that but the problem with it is that um, and we're just going to talk about landscape painting I'm not talking about still lifes or any of that where detail could definitely be maybe um, something you really want um, in, in landscape painting you, you really don't want any detail <laughs> and I've had so many people look at my work uh, in my studio and say oh your work is so so detailed but what they're talking about is the quality of the brush fracture because I know I know I didn't paint any details now we can tell in this scene we have trees we have a road um, in the reference image um, see these uh, little trees off to the far our far right side that was maybe 10 10 trees you know I simplified everything all the trees together there was maybe 30 trees or something you know I, I we can count how many tree trunks I have I have one two three four five um, and five is enough to tell the tale and to um, be restful um, extra extra detail there would have just been um, would not have looked good and that's an insight I can pass on to you and uh, and maybe you can in, uh, integrate it into your next painting um, uh, and you might say well how do I do that well one thing you can do is just blur your if well if you if you're like me and you're nearsighted I'm um, quite nearsighted I'll just take my glasses off and then I just see the big shapes just paint the big shapes paint the big values paint the predominant colors and you will have way more successful and professional looking paintings I guarantee it it's the main thing that you can do to make your work look more professional right out of the gate so you know that's from Uncle Mike to you a good little lesson um, and take that and uh, just say oh, what's the least I can put in here what's the least I can put um, and then like a lot of it depends on scale as well like this is a 6 by 8 now maybe if I was working um, you know 16 by 18 or something like that I might have had a few more details but you know uh, again if uh, you know this channel's um, really turned into a lot being a lot about Georgia Ness and it will be for a while um, and one of the reasons that I love Ness is that this um, incredible simple level of simplification that he brought to his work and I will be doing a few studies of uh, some of his older things that are f pretty chock-a-block um, and those will take more time and, and that's all good but my favorite stuff of his is got very simple forms put in the right spot with very beautiful colors and very interesting and dramatic contrasts of the values in the painting that's what creates a good painting and not um, detail detail kills your painting detail takes people out of what you're doing and um, uh, it removes them from um, just going into the picture plane and being in that space uh, it, it flattens everything for one now there are uh, painters that did a lot of detail that were brilliant painters I just saw uh, yesterday a beautiful painting by Albert Birdstadt and uh, who was amazing he's great this paintings chock-a-block with detail and he had a different agenda and his pa and we'll never say that his work was not successful and brilliant it is but um, he knew what he was doing uh, and his work was congruent you know he had a detailed aspect to what he did <clears throat> but you know I was looking at this uh, the spirit stat and things and thinking well to do a study after that would just be exhausting you know I don't want to do it <laughs> I think it's brilliant um, but uh, and I've seen the uh, the Hudson River stuff which is you know if you're not familiar that was a movement in the United States it was very popular and very prevalent before tonalism tonalism supplanted it and um, the, the main thing the tonalists changed like the the uh, Hudson River School also known as the luminists by the way a beautiful light um, great composition um, 
they tended to work really huge so um, sometimes the uh, what they were after was almost to, to, to put you in nature because the painting would be so much larger than you so it wasn't it wasn't a case of um, all the all of the painting fits into one view you'd have to scan the painting and and so when people view reality and you may or may not know this I know it's fairly common knowledge but we always get new people and we don't want to assume you know things so um, if you if you move your hand out from your face about oh let's just say a foot and a half or so and make a circle with your fingers that is the amount that you can see in focus and if you do that right now and look outside your fingers that that circle you'll see that things are not in focus that's all you see in focus at one time so anything else other than that you're scanning you're scanning and panning like they used to do in the old days when they were going to um, put a big uh, cine cinema cinematographic uh, movie on the TV screen, which was a small little square. Um, they would scan and pan, and scanning and panning is uh, what we do and how we perceive reality and how we apprehend reality. And um, as a painter, it's your job um, as a as a as a tonal. Let's just say a tonalist painter or a painter um, that's it's hip, you know. Um, you really only want to have uh, maybe a small area of your painting in strong focus or detail, um, if even that, because um, it's not necessary. Um, there will be the illusion of detail, like so. Really, what you should be more concerned with as a painter is not so much detail, but contrast, edges, right? Like so, in the w painting we're doing here, you can see the the focal point is that main tree close to where my brush is now. And that's also the area of the greatest contrast between light and dark. Now that's a tip I picked up from Bob Rome, who wrote an amazing book I would recommend to anybody who wants to paint called um, The Painterly Approach, is what it's called. I don't have it in front of me. That's out in my other, uh, my, uh, my backyard studio here. But um, The Painterly Approach, Bob Rome, R. O H M, get that book, um, and he's the one that put me onto that way early on in my painting journey. The area of the greatest contrast is the area of the greatest interest, and that should be determined and decided. Now I have other areas of contrast, say those trees right next to that main tree, but you can see the sky is not as bright there, and therefore there is less contrast. So contrast creates interest, um, and that's really how you move things in a painting. Um, and like all those uh, these bushes and foliage off in the side was um, it's quite abstracted I'm looking for textures I'm looking for the feeling of foliage I'm looking for atmosphere I'm looking for that word feeling again it's all really about feeling and getting that across um, by the way we have a minute left here so my palette in this painting was some yellow ochre but you don't look at this and say yellow ochre, so I never never used the yellow ochre at full strength. It was always used or cut um, with some other color, um, and those colors would have been like raw umber. Uh, I have uh, raw umber, black, and the brown ochre. Um, that's all that I used in this painting. I didn't use any burnt umber, and I didn't use any burnt sienna uh, because I didn't want the reds. I, I didn't want the reds. Um, I'm not full off in the green area, but I'm way away from the red and that's kind of a thing I've been sort of fascinated with uh, lately I've done that actually in several paintings here in the channel that's not too red it's not too yellow it's very umber you know anyway I guess we're getting close to the end of the day hopefully you got some good tips and advice today and thanks for getting all the way to the end of this video this painting will be for sale in my store so you can go check it out there um, I think we're doing these at around um, I'm going to say 149. Um, yeah, check it out. You want an original. That includes international shipping. Also, there's a live version of this in the members area, and that's only about an hour and a half long. It includes a little color mixing session and a bit where I discuss the reference image, and you can actually see the reference image. And those were some of the most requested things on my channel for years and years. Um, also, you know, the last bit of this video is not as sped up as the rest of the video. It's about three times the uh, speed. Anyway, thank you for joining me today. I'll be back real soon. God willing, I'll be back real soon with another video. 
um, for your edification and enjoyment. <clears throat> In the meanwhile, I would appreciate it if you do me a favor, if you do me a solid. Take good care of yourself, your family, all your loved ones. Have patience with people that have views that differ from your own. The world's getting kind of crazy, so let's just all be patient with each other. And take good care, stay out of trouble, and God bless you and your family.